All right, what's going on? This is gonna be a compilation of a few different questions that have been asked once or multiple times, and then Hunter kind of went through the comments and picked out the ones that she liked the best and the ones that have been asked the most frequently. So I have not seen these questions that are gonna be asked except for whenever I read the comments. So I don't know exactly which one she picked, but we're gonna see in just a second. So out here in the shop getting ready, got a uh, little trip coming up. Not gonna say exactly to where, but we're gonna go fish for a couple of days on a pretty good lake that's not too far away. So it's going pretty good, but we're getting rod stuff ready right now, get stuff organized for the season. Still, one of the biggest hurdles that I have every single year is making sure that everything is organized to start the tournament season. So I guess Hunter's got some questions to ask while I'm in here working. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, how do you feel about live scope in shallow fisheries like in Florida? So is it useful? <clears throat> yeah. It is. Big time, useful, exceptionally useful. Anytime you're over about six foot, if you're fishing anywhere that's six foot or deeper, you can see them really, really well from 50 or 60 feet and beyond. When you get shallower than six foot, it's really difficult to see the bass or the cover with very much clarity further than about 25, 30 feet. You can, like in perfect conditions, you can see a little bit further than that, but that three, four, two, three, four foot range, you can't really see out that far that well. Maybe there's some settings that you could play with to make it work, but in that six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 foot range, you can see them extremely well and it shows the grass very well, stumps, rocks, dock posts, everything. It shows everything extremely good. So it's very, very useful in them shallow water fisheries of Florida. What do we got? Okay, a lot of people want you to show this and talk about it. What? The rods? The rods? Can we take the bait off? <laughs> All right, so this is the cranking rod I've been using. This is actually a very, very inexpensive rod from 13. This is called the Fate Black. This is a seven foot cranking rod. It's my favorite cranking rod that I've ever used that was mass produced by any company. When I used to build my own rods, I built one almost identical to this as far as the action and power goes. I love this thing. This, I mean, it's like a, Definitely less than hundred dollar rod. 75, 85, 89 dollars, something like that. That's how much this rod costs and I use it all over the place whenever I'm cranking. Obviously I got a Concept Z on there. That Concept Z cast light baits extremely well. Got 10 pound fluorocarbon on there. But this is my favorite small little crankbait cranking rod. You know, like you throw them little little baits with little hooks like a DT4 or shad wrap, any of these little flat side balsa baits. That's the thing that really performs on this type of rod because it loads good you can cast it good still pretty lightweight and seven foot but it loads the key is it loads all the way down to two or three guides above the real seat like this part of the rod actually flexes way down here and that's really really good that's what you really want so this is this is the middle of the rod super parabolic really good action and the perfect amount of power for those number six and number five treble hooks so that's the rod that i've been using where can you get it Shop Carl's. Shop Carl's has all, not all, but most of the 13 fishing rods, and they definitely carry, they definitely carry the fake black. No, I know they carry the fake black. I use that one, and also use the seven foot three. If I'm trying to really launch something out there really far, like a medium diving crankbait that still has small treble hooks, like, you know, a DT6 or something like that, I throw that on a seven foot three medium, and I can throw it a really, really long way and get it down very, a lot deeper than most people can on like 10 pound lines. So. I use a seven foot and I use a seven foot three. Those are my main two cranking rods and they're less than a hundred bucks a piece. So that's a really, really good deal for that rod because that's literally the one that I throw. Okay, next question, you ready? Okay, so ready. when you do like wacky rig stuff, mm -hmm. do you use O-rings? And if you do, what size and what <clears throat> brand do you like? So I don't use O-rings. Sometimes whenever I'm, if I'm, if I'm wacky rigging, traditional wacky rigging, I do not use an O-ring. And the main reason for that is I want that worm to be off that hook when I set the hook. I want that worm to be inside that fish's mouth and if I set the hook, I want the hook to rip out of the worm, hook in the fish's mouth and there not be a worm on there. Because the most time when you're gonna lose fish on a wacky rig is anytime that worm balls up on the hook and then you don't get the hook point through at all. Or if that hook stays on there, just adds a little bit more resistance in between the actual, because we use small little wacky rig hooks. And if that worm is down there in the bend of the hook, it just can't penetrate quite as deep. So I personally, visualize not using the o-ring so that whenever i set the hook that worm gets ripped into and i hook that fish on top of the mouth so i don't use the o-ring for that reason now if i'm nico rigging and i got a tungsten 
weight glued in one end of the worm, I'll put a band on it then. And I actually used that, um, it's like a, uh, it's like got a band on it, then a thing off the side of it. I don't know what brand, it's like Rappel or VMC or something. It's like, it's like a little band that has a knot coming off the top of it and you can actually hook the hook through it. So I've got some of those I use and I use some traditional O-rings too, but I just, I get a bunch of different sizes and scale it to the size of the worm that I use. You know, like I think a actual five inch regular stick bait takes a five millimeter O-ring. And I think that some of those small little small mouth ones I use, I use a four millimeter O-ring on some of those smaller worms. So, I mean, it just kind of varies back and forth. You gotta kind of get a couple different ones when you use it all. But the only time that I do that is whenever I am Nico rigging. Okay. What is the best way you've found to store weights, spinner baits, and buzz baits? Spinner baits and buzz baits are extremely difficult to store. Um, the best way that I have found to store spinner baits though is, let's see if I got them right here. Let's see. These actually all got ruined this year. Every single one of them got ruined because I got water in this box and I didn't let it dry out. So, but the best way that I have found to store spinner baits is in these big open square parts in the bottom of a box. I'll just lay them down in there flat. It's not the best method. I don't really know of a good method. Things that hold spinner baits, like the actual spinner bait containers that are designed for spinner baits, they take up so much room that it's very, very difficult to, you know, like store them in your boat because it takes up so much space, so much real estate inside your boat. So the best thing that I have found is I just try to simplify. I throw a lot of half ounce double willow leaf spinner baits. I'll keep me four or five of those in one of those things. And if I want a chartreuse and white one, I keep four or five of those. And I'll have another little section of just mix match ones. So I don't keep but about 12 or 15 spinner baits in the boat at all times. You know, that's just what I keep. Something to get me through the day. If I know it's going to be a really good spinner bait bite, I'll bring extras and just have a bunch of nuanced stuff. But for the most part, I just keep it more simple. And I'll show you my buzz bait box, actually. See if I can find it over here somewhere. Let's see what we got. Buzzbait. Similar deal. Keep it relatively simple. Well, I've got a, quite a few buzz baits in there, but not that many. You know, I just keep a couple in each little thing. Like I got three or four in here, you know, with some custom blades, custom wires. This is actually my favorite buzz bait right here. That I throw the most. Got five or six of those in there. So I don't have a ton of buzz baits in here, but I, that's, that's the way that I store it. I mean, really simple. I don't have. 50 different variations of buzz baits. I just have like four or five quarters, four or five three eighths, four or five three eighths with a little bit bigger blade, and then that's about it. So I mean that's that's all I've got in the boat pretty much at all times. And I seem to catch them just fine like that. You know, like it doesn't really seem to matter. The best thing about buzz bait fishing now is we use a lot of soft plastics. So if you really want to change profile, you just take the soft plastic you have on there, you take it, you have a toad style bait, you take it off, you put a swim bait on there take it off, put a little crawl on there. So you, you can just change profile a lot because we don't use skirts much anymore. I don't use skirts hardly at all unless it's extremely cold on a buzz bait. So that's that's kind of my approach to how I store buzz baits. I just keep it simple, don't keep a lot of it, and try to keep it as organized as possible. Weights. Weights. This is how I, I store weights right here. So you can see right down here in the bottom of this box, these are all my weights in here. So. Here's drop shot weights. These are all, let's see what these are. These are all three eighths. So just a little bag of three eighths ounce drop shot weights. That's what I keep in the boat. I've got a bag of quarters just like that. I got a bag of half just like that. Then, then over here, I've got all my flipping weights. So these are three sixteenths ounce flipping weights. You know, not sponsored by them. That's just what I have. This little bag is probably 15 or 20 in this bag right here. And I size store them, store them just like that. So all weights are down here. All my gamakatsu hooks are up here. And I got some weird hooks in the middle like swim bait hooks and all that type of stuff. But that's how I store it in little bags. Always have. Just seem like it's the best approach, in my opinion, is keeping everything organized. And another big deal is <clears throat> you want to be able to find stuff, right? As fast as possible. That's a big key. Because our biggest time constraint on the water is time. I mean, our biggest constraint on the water is time. Because we have eight hours to go catch the means we can catch. So being able to find stuff as fast as possible is one of the best things that you can do and one of the biggest advantages you can have with other people is not spending a lot of time digging around in the boat. And then whenever I put them in those little bags, another thing that it does is whenever I find that bait, it's not rusted, it's not ruined, it's not all out of order, the hooks ain't, you know, got the points rolled over and the tucks and ain't got all the 
paint rubbed off of it. So I put it in those little bags, it adds a little bit of protection and it helps me be able to find it very, very efficiently. So that's how I store my weights. Pretty simple. I know this this answer could get very long, so I'm just gonna say answer in one sentence. Your classic technique and what you were targeting. At, oh at the classic? Yeah. At the classic, so I, I had two I had two main ones going. I was live scoping um, a lot of pretty good sized largemouth and spots on secondary drops where they were congregating on thread fin shad. And then my second pattern was those immediate pre-spawners that were staging right in front of where they were going to spawn. I caught some on a swim bait, caught some on a wacky rig, caught some on a jig, caught some a lot of different ways, but for the most part, it was just those staging fish. Do you think it's mostly what you were targeting or do you think it was the area that you were in? Like, do you think it was what you were doing or just your area was really good? So it was, it was two things. I feel like I found a way in practice to catch bigger largemouth than, ever, than average, and I found an area of the lake where it felt like they were pulling up to earlier than the rest of the lake. So I think it was kind of a two-way deal. I found a good area, and I found where the bigger largemouth were sitting, and that's what you have to do in those highland, highland type of lakes. Okay, when you change your crankbait hooks to the G-finesse hooks, does it make your depth get more, or does it make your baits dive deeper? Um, not usually, because those G-Finesse hooks are, there's two different variations of it. There's a G-Finesse medium heavy, and there's a G-Finesse regular. The G-Finesse regular is actually a very light wire hook, and that light wire hook is not going to make your bait, it's not gonna really weigh down your bait, because it's not a big, heavy, bulky hook. If you put that medium heavy G-Finesse on a small little suspended jerk bait, yeah, it will. But it's all about the raw weight of the hook. If that hook's not heavier than the hook you're taking off, it's not gonna affect it. But if that hook is heavier, then it's going to affect it. So, but for almost every single bait, that G Finesse is very light, very small diameter wire, and it's not going to weigh down jerk baits very often. I mean, jerk baits or crank baits or whatever very often. Have you used the Jabber Jaw? And if you have, what's your opinion on it? I've used it a little. I haven't used it a ton, but I've had my butt beat on it a couple times actually, like with people in the boat with me. So, there's times where that polarizing, extremely aggressive action just puts them in the boat, just absolutely catch them. There's definitely times where it outperforms regular crankbaits. Maybe there's times where it's too much, but for what I can tell, it just seems to catch them really good. Do you know what the name of the Gamakatsu boxes you use? Yeah, that's the G-Box 3700. Like these right here are just a standard 3700 G-Box, utility box, whatever you wanna call it. This one's that. I'll show you the other one. This is my favorite box that Gamakatsu has, actually. I'll show you my G Finesse one. So, this has got a lot of G Finesse hooks in it. Not all of them that I have, but a good bit of G Finesse hooks in it. This is the 3600 split foam. I've showed y'all this a few times, but it's got these split foam, and it holds your treble hooks. Very, very organized, very orderly. That's the 3600 with the foam inside. So that's a really, really cool one too. But the standard, the standard size in all boxes is 3700. You just gotta find one that you like. The main reason that I prefer the Gamakatsu one is because there's so many different ways to configure the actual box. Like there's every two millimeters, there's a different slot where you can put your, your dividers. So it makes it where you can configure the, the box in a million different ways. And I like that, because sometimes you might be wanting to put big crankbaits in it, and you got a, a slot for it, then you can put something small, and you gotta make a slot for it. So it's very easy to tailor it to the actual bait you're putting in it. Is the Sunline Flipping FC and Power 2C more like Shooter? I believe the Sunline Power 2C, Flipping FC, and the Structure FC are closer to Shooter. In my opinion, those three are very close to Shooter. Just got a couple little variations of it. And then you've got the Crank, the Dost Strike, and I don't know what other kind. They're closer to the Sniper. So, a lot of the ones for wine and baits, reaction baits, closer to Sniper. A lot of the ones for the big high impact hook sets are closer to Shooter. So, personally, I just use Shooter and Sniper. Been using a little bit of Crank FC this year and some Dose Strike this year. But for the most part, if I'm going flipping or on structure or anything like that, it's just going to be Shooter. That's what, that's what I'm going to use. But yeah, I would say those are closer to Shooter. Okay, what's your favorite braid? Favorite braid? I got two of them. Got one that's coming out that. Can't really talk much about it yet, but that is the probably the best braid I've ever put my hands on. But for flipping, punching mats, stuff like that, super high strength stuff that I need like the strongest line there is, it's gonna be the Sunline Asagai X Plasma. 
I, I pronounce it different every single time that I mention it on camera. Literally, I pronounce it different because I'll pronounce it, then I'll hear somebody else talk about it, and I'm like, maybe I say it wrong, and they say it right. And I hear somebody else say it, and I'm like, well, maybe they say it wrong, and everybody else says it right. Or, or you know, so I, I, I don't know, but this the X Plasma, Asaga, and then the SX1 is also my best for, my favorite for casting and anything like that. I like the SX1. It's really, really good for that. How what do else you we like got? the new Tour Pro? How do you like the new Tour Pro? The trailer motor? Mm -hmm. I love that thing. It's got the smoothest foot pedal. That's why I've always liked running motor guy trailer motors. I know that the motor is like bulletproof. Extremely strong lower end motor. Like it's the same one we've used forever. Really strong, really powerful. Doesn't break. But the foot pedal on that motor guide is the difference maker. Like you can you can just like easily turn it and then like when you're using forward face sonar, it's just very easy for me to pan the exact amount I want to because it's got such a smooth trailer motor where other trailer motors, I feel like it's very, very difficult to like, it's very difficult to move like an inch or two. Like it's very difficult to just like barely make small adjustments whenever you're trying to pan around. You know, you're on a brush pile and your boat's moving, you try to just barely pan and it's really hard to. On that motor guy, it seems very, very easy. So I've just always liked that trailer motor. Never had any problems with it. So the foot pedal though is the difference maker. It's my favorite part of that thing. What do you think is the best brand scale for the boat? What's the most reliable one you've found? Basically, they're all pretty good if you keep them out of water. Basically. Like if you don't if you don't get them wet, they're all gonna last pretty good. But the one that most pros use has to be there's that catch commander, that yellow one that logs your fish's weight. That's the one that a lot of people use. I've never used that one personally. Then the other one a lot of people use is the Rapala scale where it, it logs your fish's weight also and you gotta cull with it. But the Catch Commander I think culls on its own. It's very, very fast. The Rapala scale you have to like press a couple buttons and it culls. But I use that Rapala one. Uh, most pros probably use the Rapala one and then some of them use the Catch Commander. So it's definitely probably gonna be those two. Who do you think is the best non-pro bass fisherman? Oh, I, I have no idea. I literally don't, ain't got a clue. Best non-pro bass fisherman. I literally don't know. No answer. I, I mean, I don't have anything popping out to that's, me. That's all the questions I have. Okay, well that's it. I'm sorry if I offended any non-pro bass fishermen. I, re I genuinely don't have anybody that just pops into my head of who's the best non-pro bass fisherman. I know there's, there's guys in certain regions like there's guys that dominate on, you know, like Chickamauga, guys that dominate on Gunnersville, guys that dominate in Florida like as a whole, guys that dominate in Alabama really well. But as far as being a the best non-pro bass fisherman, I don't know enough people to really give a good educated guess. But there's definitely some guys that dominate their region of wherever they're from. So sorry if I offend anybody, but your boy don't know. Is that it? Yep. Appreciate it, guys. That's the questions. Hunter liked. So, had to pick some of them out. Hopefully, I answered them as good as I could. Hopefully, I didn't talk too much like a politician talking circles, but that's what I usually do. So, appreciate you guys watching. About to load the boat up to head out in the morning. So, we'll see y'all.